Kia from Auckland in Aotearoa, New Zealand, when we're currently on another COVID lockdown. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to do something that I've been meaning to do for a while, and let's make this short video introducing these beautiful historical bassoons. You may have seen these being played, and my students have definitely seen them lying around my studio. But if you were too shy to ask about them, or if you think they're not really relevant to modern bassoon playing, then I've made this presentation for you. Historical performance is so widespread now, and I encourage every modern player to find opportunities to try these instruments, whether you go on to seriously study them or not. They're a wonderful way to put your modern playing in context and discover your roots, so to speak, as an instrumentalist. Um, and they aren't just instruments that existed before improvements were made. I feel sad when people assume the bassoon was only perfected in the 20th century. These earlier bassoons were perfect and existed in their own right and were cherished by great composers. So even if you play, say, Mozart concerto on a modern bassoon, which is very valid and we all do it, um, why wouldn't you also want to know more about the instrument that Mozart would have actually heard? So I'm going to briefly show you each instrument. These are modern copies of, um, of older ones from museums. I will list all the makers in the descriptions below. The first is the Dulcian or Kirtle. It's not known where the earliest bassoon first, when the earliest bassoon first appeared, but this is certainly one of the first bassoon-shaped instruments that achieved huge popularity. The principle of the two bores in the one piece of wood, so like your boot joint, um, is what made it uniquely a bassoon or a bundle of sticks, as it became known. So the dulcian is basically like a giant boot joint. It's all made in one piece of wood. And it filled the need for a bass instrument um, for the instrumental consort that was more agile than the trombone, more powerful than the recorder, and easier to transport than the big bass shawm, um, which was very long and you basically needed to stand on a stool to play it. Um, it was made in different sizes, so... We have the smaller tenor alto and the teeny tiny soprano dulcian, which is still bassoon shaped. It has the double bore. Um, and I wish I could show that to you, but we're on lockdown. It's in my studio, so I can't go and fetch it. Then there's also the contrabass dulcian, which I wish I did have. Um, that's like a contra. It's um, wonderful. Um, but this is the bass dulcian which corresponds in register and fingering to the modern bassoon um, and it's really what became the most popular of the the family and it was really very widespread some beautiful solo repertoire written for it the bertoli sonatas de selma fantasia all intended for dulcian um it's also known as the Chorist Fagot, as it was played um, a lot with choirs, and it came to the Americas, um, where it was used a lot in um, churches where they had no organ, just to keep the choir in tune, it was also played by nuns um, to create the lower voices in choral music where there were no male singers. And the earliest iconography of the Dulcian is around 1560, so that's later than you would think. Today, Dulcians are mostly made at modern pitch, um, so A equals 440, 41, 42. Um, sometimes you get the 466 Dulcians, which is at the higher pitch that Renaissance and early Baroque specialists like to play at, so a semitone or half-step higher than modern bassoon. This is a 466 Dulcian, which is why it looks a little bit on the small side. Now we move on to the Baroque bassoon, which appeared um, late um, 17th century. 
Um, and the biggest difference is that it's made in joints and it has the dismountable tenor and long joints. So anatomically, it's the same as your modern bassoon. The reed is bigger, closer in size to a contra reed, and the instrument is at 415, a semitone lower than the modern bassoon. Um, once you've mastered it, you understand how much more natural it is to play Baroque continuo parts. All those years I played the Messiah on modern bassoon, trying to keep as light and soft as possible, and it was exhausting. Um, on Baroque bassoon, it is much easier, and it suddenly makes sense. The articulation, that the right articulation that you need for, for Baroque continuo is, is right there. Also for Vivaldi concertos, all that hopping around the registers, those octaves that go into the, the notes that you normally flick, see on Baroque bassoon no flick keys that's all just done with our embouchure and support so you can change registers very rapidly and have those lovely beautiful octave leaps which um, is so characteristic of Vivaldi and for bassoon music in general. Um, you'll see Baroque bassoons with a straight bell so this one has the beautiful turned bell but more commonly, they have a straight bell like this classical bassoon with a beautiful um, brass bell crown, which is a lovely embellishment. Now, here is the classical bassoon, which is the instrument that Mozart would have written for. And I think my favourite thing about the, the classical bassoon, what I think the classical bassoon does best, is that it's got the absolutely beautiful singing singing tenor register. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, the bore um, is narrower than Baroque bassoon, so you can really get, get up there. Um, the slow movement of the Mozart concerto is just perfection on the classical bassoon, as are all the, all the wonderful solos um, in the orchestral repertoire of the time. Classical bassoon is at 430, so a half semitone or half half step lower than modern pitch, which is a tricky one. But when you hear the good classical orchestras playing Mozart, Haydn and Beethoven, it all makes sense. The wind solos really pop. You can hear them clearly um, and it's fabulous. Um, I'm trying to I'm going to post some links to recommended recordings and further reading in the description below. Now, lastly, on the classical bassoon, you'll see a few extra keys that are not on Baroque bassoon or Dulcian. These thumb ones are intended to get into the high register, so B flat, B, C, C sharp, and then in the Weber concerto, it even goes up to a high D. Um, they were never intended originally as flick keys. They only assumed that dual purpose after the modern bassoon was invented. And I hope you do all use the flick keys for modern bassoon, but for classical bassoon, these are not flick keys. Again, you, you get over the break with your embouchure and support. Um, on all of these older instruments, most of the accidentals are created with cross fingerings. So for example, B flat, is played by one and three, just like on the recorder, like um, a um, E flat on the descant recorder. You can add extra holes or keys um, to vent, you know, just to make that note better in tune. Um, but the basic fingerings are cross fingerings, likewise for the, the E flat, um, which I think is the only one that we still use for modern bassoon. Um, with these cross fingerings you really have to be very flexible to voice them properly because they're quite capricious. So that's what I mean when I say playing the historical instruments has made my modern bassoon playing more flexible because you have to be very flexible to play these well. Now, the transition from the classical bassoon to the modern instrument is fascinating and rich and is the subject of a whole other presentation. I really miss hearing William Waterhouse speaking about this. He could talk about it for hours in the most compelling way. 
I played these instruments for about 20 years, so started them at grad school, and they've totally enriched my musical life and alongside modern bassoon playing. I've had so much opportunity to play these instruments with groups such as the Australian Brandenburg Orchestra, Australian Classical Romantic Orchestra and NZ Baroque. And that's been one of the most rewarding aspects of my freelance portfolio, so to speak. And they've been a great earner as well. Um, playing them has definitely improved my modern bassoon. And most importantly, it's helped me to understand and really get inside the music of the earlier eras. Um, I think of it as similar to learning another language.